I would like to begin this very important plenary meeting, Voices of the Landscape. And for this, I would like to introduce our moderator, Musunda Mumba. She is in the Terrestrial Ecosystem Unit of UN Environment. She has over 20 years experience working in mountains and other terrestrial ecosystems. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Great. Welcome. Welcome to the Global Landscapes Forum 2018 here in Bonn. My name is Muson Damumba, and I work with UN Environment based out of Nairobi. There is a saying in my language, a proverb actually, which says, Ichalo Vantu. The world is people. And what does that mean? That means that people exist in landscapes. People do things, people act, people make decisions, people make good decisions, people make bad decisions. So today we're very lucky and quite blessed really to have an amazing array of thought leaders, community leaders, people who are engaged in some of the most exciting work in their different and respective communities. So welcome to the voices of the landscape. I just want to say to everybody that we're using Slido. Everybody familiar with Slido? Okay, so if you go to Slido, S-L-I-D-O dot com, you can download it onto your laptop or onto your smartphone or just even go on, online on, and I don't know, there you go, Slido dot com, and that is the hashtag. And once you log in, it gives you the option to type in a question, and there are two questions that I would like to, you to address. First question is, if you listen to the landscape, what do you hear? If you listen to the landscape, what do you hear? What are the key ingredients for creating action? And the reason we're going to draw out from your responses is we're going to do a word cloud to really show and get a sense of what people are saying and what people are thinking and the ingredients they've used in their respective communities. So without further ado, I just want to take this opportunity to introduce the panel members over here. Um, we have Janine Yazi, seated in the middle over there. And Janine is a Sustainable Development Program Coordinator for International Indian Treaty Council. But she's also the co-chair um, co of the Indigenous Peoples Working Group under the Sustainable Development Goals 2030. And seated at my very end is the gentleman, since I have to be gender sensitive, um, is Nana. And Nana Yo Osi Dakar is from Ghana and works for the Green Republic project and has extensive experience working within the community and will tell us some um, uh, sort of experiences from Ghana. Right next to him is a lady called Zipora Matumbi from Kenya, from the Mount Kenya region in Meru, um, and she's going to also tell us about the work that she's been involved in around forest um, ecosystems. And last but not obviously the, the least is um, Maribel. Uh, and Maribel is going to actually talk about um, following the film, there will be a film at the end of this session, uh, called The Landscape uh, Heroes. Um, and what you're going to see is now an experience from her and also to share how they've supported this um, mechanism or this award process and the different and diverse experiences from uh, these communities. So without further ado, I would like to um, begin really by asking my panel members, and you have you know, two to three minutes to just sort of give us a little bit of a background about yourself in terms of the communities that you're working with. How are you doing this work? And I will start with you, Nana, please. Or you may come over here since you, ha you don't have the speaker, please. If you want to sit. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Nana Yao Ose Dakwa, but you can call me Nana from Ghana. <laughs> and um, I'm the team lead and convener of the Green Republic Project, uh, an organization that works with young people to help save our environment in Ghana and the rest of the world by extension through the act of tree planting. Now, in 2008, 
myself and a team of dedicated young Ghanaians led a movement to save our country from the abyss of war. You know, elections have led to several conflicts in Africa, and in 2008, my country, Ghana, was on the brink of going to war because of elections. And um, during that time, myself and a group of young people, celebrities, came together, toured 10 regions of Ghana to engage our fellow young people not to heed to the calls of violence by some politicians. And after that, we worked in all the 10 regions of Ghana to ensure that we went through that election peacefully in 2008 to the admiration of all. Indeed, after the, the campaign, the ambassador for the campaign, who was a young musician, was given a National Honest Award. Fast forward 2018, 10 years after we evolved, we find the challenge of climate change as an issue of violent conflict and war. That's how we see it. And so again, we are shifting focus from building peace between human to human to a new peace building agenda of human and nature. Because we've, we've, we think that we humans have perpetrated so much violence against our environment and the environment is no longer taking it again. And so what the environment is doing to us now is to pay us back for all the violence we've perpetrated against it. We cut down trees for our own selfish gains to make wealth at the detriment of the collective. And so we are saying that the same energies that we invested in ensuring that our country, Ghana, then became peaceful and consolidated the peace architecture of the country, we are once again engaging the same energy and tenacity of purpose to ensure that young people lead in the fight against climate change by planting trees, and not just that, but also caring for the trees that we plant. We are of the view that we can win the war against climate change if we as humans begin a reconciliation process by restoring the, restoring the things that we have damaged on planet Earth. And so we are focusing on contributing by planting millions and millions of trees in our country and also in other countries that will be ready to work with us. So in May this year, we started the Green Republic project as a specific peace product. Even though it's, it's about the environment, mind you, we are seeing it as a peace campaign where we are reconciling humanity with nature. And already, we've been able to galvanize the support of thousands and thousands of young people in Ghana to come to that firm conclusion that as young people, we cannot only demand climate justice, but also take the lead by purchasing our future with the present. We believe that if we do not act now, the consequences tomorrow will be so dire that we cannot stand it. And so we are here today to join great minds and like minds in the the fight against climate change and global warming, to build synergies and also to work together in reconciling humanity and nature. Thank you. Thank you, Nana. Thank you very much for that intervention. I'm sure all of you are wondering that there is an individual in my panel that I did not introduce. In the middle, is a lady from the Philippines, and her name is Kate Gaido. And Kate is the only one actually on this panel from an island country. And in fact, the Philippines, I understand, has like a thousand islands, if not more. 7,000. 7, now imagine that. Well, I've never been there. And we would like to hear from her because here is a country that is so diverse, indigenous communities, um, peoples, and also the landscape in itself, the complexity and the challenges of island countries. 
Can you tell us, Kate, in terms of your work, what you've done, how, how has it panned out in the work that you've been involved in around the landscape itself? Okay. Go okay. ahead. You can okay. speak from there. Okay. Good morning. Magandang umaga. Uh, I just realized two weeks ago that I will be speaking in a big audience. So I'm from Non-Timber Forest Product Exchange Program. It's an NGO based in the Philippines. It's NTFPEP Philippines. It is also a part of NTFP Asia, which is a collaborative network of NGOs and community organizations working in different landscapes in six countries. Uh, about 15 years ago, I had this discussion with the traditional healer. And he was opposing, together with um, his communities, an activity or a project from coming in in their ancestral domain. It's, an, it's a mining company. And he said that um, the, 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 the project, if it, it, will, it will kill him if the project will continue because um, he will have no source of the medicinal plants that he used in treating and curing the community members in their ancestral domain. And the project continued. So after that, I said, I will help in the protection of forest resources that are important to the local communities. So I work with NTFP. So with NTFP, uh, these are the different biological materials that are harvested from the forest for human use. So this includes honey, resin, rattan, and medicinal plants. So we work on the promotion and development in organizing and strengthening community-based NTFP enterprises. And I thought after uh, working with NTFPs will be easier. But we we, um, I realized the community's main challenge now is even if they are indigenous communities and they own their resources, they still need to get permitting from the government. So, um, like for example, the Almasiga Resin Enterprise in Palawan, uh, they need to renew their permit every year, and about 10% of their income goes to the permitting process, and sometimes it takes five years. So what we do, we, we do lobbying efforts with the, with the government, and gladly, the, last year, a uh, national working group was um, developed to look in simplifying the NTFPs. So besides, um, besides the lobbying efforts at the permitting process, we also promote indigenous community conserved areas because it will recognize the important role of indigenous communities in the protection of the forest. Uh, we believe that adding values to NTFP secure livelihoods and promote a healthier forests. But the, after my, the two decades of my work with NGOs, local communities continue to experience many challenges and in the landscapes that we work, these challenges include um, coming in of mega dams, mining activities, and also governance issues. So I leave my sharing with a question from a traditional leader who I, who I saw in a Green Climate Fund consultation. And he said, why do, in the, why do you keep on inviting us, the indigenous communities, in the consultations but if at the end of the activity, at the end of the day, it will not be up to us to decide whether the, the, whether the projects uh, will be, what, on, who, on what projects will in, be implemented. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Kati, for that intervention. I want to turn back to Africa, to Zipora from Kenya. Um, Zipporah, you've been a, a community leader, a thought leader, looking at the Meru community and around the forest issues there. And I understand that there is um, a manifesto that you have developed. Can you share with us this manifesto and also the commitment from the community? Yes, please. Morning, all of you. Yes, I'm Spora Matumbi from Kenya. I was uh, the former of Meru Forest and Environmental and Conservation and Forest Protection Association. And now I'm the chairperson of Meru County 
community forest associations, which is an umbrella and bondi, to join all the CFAs. I am also the treasurer of Farm Forestry Small Owner Producers Association of Kenya. I am also a bondi member of National Alliance of Community Forest Associations in Kenya. This is the Robin Group. And over the past 20 years, I have the, uh, I had an opportunity to plant trees, more than three million trees of Ndingirindant Mount Kenya Forest, which is a major forest in, in our country, Kenya. I did, the, I did this together with groups which I learned as a chairperson. In particular, I registered up to 18 community forest associations, all in the Mount Kenya region. The groups were aimed at conserving and protecting forests. We also planted up to date over 1 million trees on the farms of the association members. Therefore, we were working on the landscape both in the forest and on farm. Why we do this? I remember how the first was. When I was growing up, then the forest was intact. The water flow was very high. There was a lot of fuero wound, animal fiends were plenty, and there was a system whereby communities were benefiting by planting trees and cultivating food, and they were able to uplift their living standards. But from 1990s, the forest started being destroyed. Trees were being cut and the water started being scarce. Animals conflict started and the fuero, uh, fuero wound was also becoming scarce. It was at that time that I started thinking of how we can restore the forest and protect it to ensure that I have access to the service and the goods from the forest, which were increasing and becoming scarce. Therefore, from about 1992, I mobilized initial my women friends started a tree nursery in one of our group members' farm so that we can plant trees where they had been cut in the forest. We gave the seedlings to the forest department to the, uh, that is in our government in Kenya to be planted in the open areas and in the parts of the forest. Five years later, we started an environmental and the conservation and the forest protection set up of groups because we wanted to join the government legally to plant trees in the forest. To stop human world conflicts, we robbed in the Kenya World Life Service Together, we contracted an uh, elephant solar fence to keep elephants away from our own, own chambers. Anjani, this is the time I came to understand that. Anjani of a thousand miles begins with the first step. I started as an individual concerned about the forest and they wanted to do something about it. And then, I was able to pursue others with, the, with a common interest to join. Therefore, no effort is too small, no effort is meaningless, all efforts matter, just in be committed and in be focused. Planting a tree takes time, effort and resources. Therefore, you should be patient because it takes long before you can gain from planting tree. Some people think when they see a grown tree, they see money, but don't think about the time and the work done for the tree to grow. Cutting a tree is very easy. I was very much encouraged when the, intro, when the, uh, the bill was introduced, that is the Kenyan Forest Bill, 
2000 and 2000. This bill was accommodating the community, inviting communities to participate in various activities in the forest and to view the forest belongs to us, but not, not the, the, property, the government property, as we were thinking before. So we, we can work together. It recognized communities and our contribution to forest conservation. Therefore, an important enabling condition was created by the signing of the 2005 Forest Act. We were thus able to create community forest association to develop management plans for community forest association to sign management agreements, which I signed with the Kenya Forest Service. This is an important thing that I am preferring success to be adopted and implemented at a wider scale. This is an important issue after the Global Landscape Forum that was held in August this year in Nairobi. About 28 of us for nine African countries came together to discuss this issue of what the critical factors are for successful landscape restoration and importantly on how best to scale up the success. We thought that the key factors that drive successful restoration in all our settings were all. Communities in being in charge, gender equity, where both men and women, both elderly and young, youth in involvement in the landscape, considering their future, supported policies, policies fit within the landscape context, and that, uh, and that put communities in charge of initiatives. Having the landscape knowledge, Indigenous knowledge works together with the science. How do we scale up these successes? We thought that there were several groups of issues that need to be addressed. These are policy for more government support and political goodwill reflected through policies supportive and into blanket and their enforcement of restoration and the policies that enhance from information, dissemination, and the accountability. Tenor and the rights. Fundamental communities, land and the three tenor rights should be strengthened, including especially women rights. Benefits distributions. An equitable distribution of benefits, including financial, to communities from forest resources with an emphasis on gender equality and the youth involvement. High rounds, landscape restoration efforts should support community live rounds, access to markets, payment of ecosystem services schemes, and the, and the meaningful engagement with the private sector are a potential five ways. Local communities take charge of land restoration activities within the context of all inclusive stakeholders engagement processes. Partnership, strengthening partnerships, networking and the running towards landscape restoration, capacity building. Scaling up of successful restoration programs to more communities in wider areas through exchange programs, capacity building, and the involvement of local communities in both international forums where their success stories can be earned and shared. Recharge. 
more funding allocated to applied science, which also takes into account indigenous knowledge in order to provide information to support in the station making the influence policies for sustainable landscape installation. What are the challenges to scale up? The strength of customary practices in Africa. Where I came from, culture and the traditional influence who can plant a tree and who can hone the land. It also influences local leadership because of this, women who are about 50% of the population can get included and left out, out of the tree planting and the distillation <coughs> efforts. This is going to be a major challenge. So even if we have laws and the policies that dictate inclusive, the practice on the ground is very different. Based on my experience, there are several things we can do to overcome challenges. For example, we can raise awareness of the value of women's contribution to landscape restoration. I, for one, even though I am a woman, I was able to mobilize people to plant up to three, over 300 three tree <coughs> of the Greenland forest. That is in our Mount Kenya forest in Kenya. Women are able to contribute value to these processes just as men are. We can work closely with the traditional leaders so that they can champion women's rights and the capabilities. In my community, when the meal only traditional leadership can come to find out about my achievements in the restoring the ingredient areas. They started inviting me to their meetings to discuss about the environment. They even changed my name and they started calling me, that is in 1999, which means someone who can source and bring to the people. On my closing remarks, <laughs> let us join together and have a teamwork so that we can restore our forests, landscapes together. Together we can make it. Lastly, I really appreciate the GRF for this approach because I learned a lot from international actors, and I am excited to share my grassroots experiences with international actors. This kind of interaction is very good for us communities because now you are uplifting our standards. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zipora. Thank you so much for that intervention. I would like to introduce Janine Yazi, who comes from the Dinata uh, peoples, um, indigenous communities in the southwest of the United States of America. And she has extensive experience of having worked within her community on really very complex and, and yet very, very fundamental and important issues around the landscape. Um, Janine, over to you, please. Yeah, eh. She had Janine Yazi and she had the Netta de Nasha, Tinanjin in Schlendo, Torichini, Bashishin, Nathana de Shichedo, Disguide at Chanel. To begin my time here in Bonn, I had to carry out customary practice of giving thanks to the land and the people from here. So I went to the Rhine River where I asked for permission to carry with me my history, my experiences, and share the stories of the water protectors of North America here in this beautiful place. So I thank the people of the Rhine River for creating this space and welcoming us here to exchange the knowledge that is so necessary for our world going forward. 
as we're confronting this question about what does, um, what are the successful ingredients of landscape management, um, we don't need to look very far to find out that 80% of the world's remaining biological diversity remains on indigenous lands, and that a key part of our success is our communal management and the traditional ecological knowledge that we've carried forward for generations to maintain those practices of living in balance, honoring our relationship to all life within our ecosystems. And yet, despite those successes, we're also confronted with the continual onslaught against our lands, territories, and resources by extractive industries, by big business, by the assimilation into the privatization of lands and resources, and now by the pressures and impacts of climate change. When you break down what our practices mean and why they're successful, it is because of the recognition that individuals collectively reinforcing sustainable and, and um, meaningful behaviors are the key for realizing and implementing the type of solutions that we need. And this is why it is so fundamentally, fundamentally important to not only my people and indigenous peoples the world over who are struggling to continue these practices, but for all of life, that we honor rights as the foundation for our work going forward. Many of you noticed I have a red hand across my face, um, and I, I haven't gotten as many people coming up to me asking me what this represents, and I was a little surprised by that. Uh, but it's meant to elicit those questions because this represents uh, the endemic of missing and murdered indigenous women in my communities and throughout North America. I come from the occupied territories of New Mexico where it ranks number one in the United States for the uh, number of murdered women, indigenous women, um, throughout, the, throughout the United States. Every day, we are dealing with these impacts against our communities, so we cannot, we don't have the luxury of looking at these solutions and uh, at these issues in silos. We cannot address climate change without addressing our political, social, economic, environmental inequalities that exist in our communities. We cannot think about and begin to imagine the hope for adaptation and for mitigation of these issues without addressing the prevalence of youth suicide beginning with children as young as 10. We cannot think about what kind of collaborative partnerships can we create that are going to be meaningful and that are going to nurture the success of our projects without addressing the legacy of ongoing colonization within our lands and our territories. And we cannot begin to imagine and implement the type of alternative forms of governance that's going to create the pathway that we all need to, to realize a truly just and sustainable world that all of our generations deserve if we don't confront the gendered violence and the continued violence and, and silencing of our LGBTQ uh, relatives and of our women in our, in our communities. And we cannot hope to create the, the type of healthy ecosystems um, that our planet depends on without addressing the ongoing contamination created by extractive industries, leading to the real multi-generational impacts uh, that, that we're dealing with when fetuses uh, are, are being born with uranium and other contaminants in their bodies, equivalent to adult people just from the exposure of the mothers uh, to these environmental contaminants. There's so much to share, there's so much to explore about the successes and the things that we have been so great at doing despite these challenges. And so I'm extremely excited for next year's uh, GLF event to look at this in depth and how we can apply a rights framework to improve and evolve our collective work so that we can be successful in creating the world that we truly deserve. I hope that you join us in our discussion forum uh, tomorrow morning so that we can discuss more from the Indigenous Peoples Major Group, uh, the solutions that we are, we are championing in real time that greatly need your support and assistance, but that also offer <laughs> these real examples for how to apply a rights framework because that is truly 
the way that we will be uh, not only able to collectively imagine and co-create the landscape initiatives that are going to lead to true land and water, water sustainability, but we're, that's also the way we're going to imagine the alternative governance systems, the alternative economies that are going to be necessary to support that collective evolution going forward. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Janine, for sharing your experience, your people, your space, and also for just really highlighting the complexity, and I think it came out very well in all the discussions and the conversations, the complexity of our landscapes and the challenges, but also the holistic nature of our very much, you know, landscapes where we all come from and where we exist. At this juncture, I also want to say that there were um, about 22 stories from 22 different landscapes that were documented, brought together, and through these stories, um, we were able to kind of, you actually voted, and many other people out there in the world voted, and and um, we came up with um, eight and I think eight stories and we're just about to have a film to really show the depth and width of all these incredible spaces. Um, we've got examples from Guatemala, from Brazil, from Peru, um, from Tanzania. Really, really excited. So if we can have the film on now. Thank you so much. I really want that soundtrack. It's so good. Um, I want to introduce Maribel from uh, Livelihoods Venture, who's going to talk about the actual um, case study from India and the support they've given it, and really how exciting this prospect has been for them. Please, over to you, Maribel. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, I feel extremely humbled and honored to be here today 
not only because I was given the opportunity to join this session and share our story with you, but because by doing so, I'm representing 40,000 courageous smallholder farmers of the Araku Valley in India. My name is Maribel. I am working for the Livelihoods Funds, a family of funds supported by the private sector who have been working with these farmers since uh, 2010 in collaboration with our partner in the field, the Nandi Foundation. So when we arrived in Araku eight years ago, what we found was a land with high levels of deforestation. We found uh, a group of people uh, living in deep poverty, uh, relying on food gathering and hunting for feeding themselves. Agriculture was not a thing there. But we also found this, uh, this group of people having something really strong in common the philosophy of sharing and of caring for each other. We also found a potential partner, the Nandi Foundation, who had already identified that the way to work with these people was actually to create an integrated uh, livelihoods model based on their culture, their values, and most importantly, bringing back the link between these communities and the forest, the land, the water, the environment. We found a model based on uh, biodynamic uh, agriculture, which was ready to be scaled up. And especially a model that has been developed based on the requests of this community, starting with growing coffee, which they saw at the time as the most exotic uh, crop that they wanted to grow. So in 2010, we launched our first program there. In this case, we focused on tree planting. Uh, within a few years, um, 14,000 smallholder farmers um, planted over 6 million trees, over 6,000 uh, 6, hectares. They planted 3 million trees of uh, coffee trees and three million trees of different uh, fruit trees uh, with which they were not only feeding themselves, but also selling them in the local markets and getting some income. They created a forest uh, where the soil became much more fertile. Uh, the, the soil was uh, retaining much more water and uh, they, could, uh, they, could, they started being uh, farmers, uh, growing different crops, feeding themselves, getting money for that. Um, I think one of the key uh, milestones of this, uh, of this phase was uh, when, they, when they started uh, growing coffee, they, they understood that by growing uh, high quality coffee, organic coffee, they could get four times more income than by growing uh, the standard quality of coffee. So actually in 2017, they decided to open uh, what they call the Araku Coffee Boutique in Paris, in a very chic uh, district in Paris. And now their coffee is distributed worldwide. So in these years that we've been working together, uh, the Araku people have been coming to us, to Nandi Foundation, and they, they've been flagging issues. They've been seeing that uh, wild grazing uh, is uh, deforesting their lands. They've been, they've been telling us water is scarce, and so on and so forth. So just a few months back, we renewed our commitment to work together. And at the beginning of 2019, we will launch this new project covering the whole landscape of the valley from the top of the hills to the, to the basins, uh, the, the rice paddies uh, in the valley. Um, in this case, uh, we will work with 40,000 smallholder farmers across 18,000 hectares and 180 villages. This project will help uh, sequestrate 2.3 million tons of, uh, of carbon. And in this case, since we've been talking to them, listening to them, we are planning to implement five different uh, components in the project that they've been actually asking us uh, to do. So 
On the first uh, on the first phase, of course, we are going to be working with coffee, uh, coffee cultivation. Uh, everybody in the valley understands now the the economic value and and the benefits that coffee growing, high quality coffee growing is bringing them. But we are also introducing some other biodynamic agri agricultural practices. Uh, not only like composting, but also we are planting now uh, millet spouses. Uh, we are working on further forest, uh, uh, fuel wood forest, and at the end of this list, uh, restoration of the top hill. Uh, I think I'm, I'm running out of time. Uh, I, I told you I was representing these 40,000 uh, smallholder farmers, but I don't, I don't want to be the voice, the only voice here alone, so that's why you've been seeing their testimonials on, on the background. These are their voices. These are the voices of people who decided to take a step forward and restore their own landscape to, to live in a sustainable way and in harmony with their surrounding ecosystem. These are the voices of our landscape heroes. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Maribel. I, I want to take this opportunity to really sincerely thank the speakers, um, voices of the landscape, and I want you to give them the most massive, biggest round of applause, please. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. I want to take this opportunity to introduce Selena Abraham, who's going to be the next moderator for the next session, which is very exciting and is focused on the youth. So Selena, over to you, and thank you to all the speakers. Thank you very much.